Peter, uh, as a neuroscientist and myself as a former neuroscientist, the primary paradigm of what we do is to try to understand how the ultimately that the, the mind emerges from what we know to be the physical processes of the brain. Uh, from your perspective, what are some of the principles that we have to understand about the so-called mind? Is that something real or it's something that is more of uh, it comes along with the brain territory but is not really significant? Right. So the uh First thing that needs to be confronted, I think, is the question of epiphenomenalism. Um, so the deeper question than free will, or even the, a deeper question than mental causation, is whether information can be causal in the universe. I think it can, but it requires um, perhaps thinking of information in a different way, not as a sort of energetic force, but a, as a kind of set of constraints on possible uh, outcomes. So uh, information is not causal by causing real particles go, to go this way versus that, but by placing constraints on what possible particle paths might become real. Okay, so how do you go from that concept of, of information uh, to information being relevant to understand what the mind is? All right. All right, so let me take a step back. You know, many philosophers, such as Hume, have said there's two extremes. There's determinism or randomness, and that's all you get. Under determinism, some people have said, well, there's no real free will there, not a strong free will where events could have turned out otherwise because under determinism, they can't have turned out otherwise. So there's no strong free will there. Compatibilists try to, you know, f you know, redefine find, the world. They refi redefine the world as, you know, freedom from coercion, but it seems kind of a, a, a Kant called that a wretched subterfuge. <laughs> then there's randomness and under randomness, the agent plays no role in the outcome. Anything can happen. You know, ants can start dancing around with top hats. It just seems utterly random. It has nothing to do with the agent. I think that uh, this is mistaken. There is a middle path between the sort of skilla and charybdis of, of t determinism and randomness, and that is that uh, the nervous system can parameterize what the possible the possibilities are in the immediate future. So, for example, if I say to you. Think of a politician with red hair. Well, okay, what are the criteria? It's a human being, it's a politician, they have red hair. Those are the constraints. Well, lots of people might come to mind. It might be Margaret Thatcher, it might be Angela Merkel, um, but someone will come to mind. So the outcome in this case uh, is not utterly random. It wasn't just ants dancing around with top hats and it wasn't predetermined. Presumably, if I had rewound the universe just due to randomness in the system, you might have come up with a different person. Um, so this is a kind of constrained, highly constrained randomness. So information can be causal in the sense that it sets the parameters of what possibly can happen in the future. Okay, uh, and we've talk, you've talked about top-down causation. Uh, most neuroscientists think only in terms of bottoms up. But, you go from fundamental particles to neurochemistry, neurophysiology, cellular biology systems, and, and that's the way you, uh, you define how the brain works and, and therefore generates the mind. Uh, is downward causation, where you start with the mind affecting the, the lower biology, is that, is that a, a kind of a, an imposed metaphor and how things work, or in some real mechanism, is, is that a, a true description? of how, uh, how the mind works. It seems the latter would be very difficult. Right, so how might top-down causation work? What, what does top-down or downward causation really mean? I think it means something very tough. It means that information can uh, alter what uh, particle trajectories are allowed or possible, um, or which particle trajectories will become real. It sounds like you know the imposition of some sort of ghostly thing down on the level of particles. Uh, well, I don't think it's that. I don't think information is ex exerting forces. Uh, however, I do believe that there's a kind of downward causation at play, and that has to do with uh, the reparameterization of what is possible in the next, in the future. Right. So the the main arguments against free will and the main arguments against mental causation have been so-called causa sui arguments. The argument that well, if a mental event is realized in these neuronal events, right. how can it possibly change its own physical basis? Well, it can't. 
you can't pick yourself up by your bootstraps. There is no causa sui. That's granted. However, the way out of this is to say that information realizing current neural activity doesn't change its own physical basis now, but it plays a role in reparameterizing what neural activity is possible in the future. It could be milliseconds in the future, it might even be years in the future. So then, for that to be possible, you need to have a neural code that affords um, the possibility of neurons changing each other's informational parameters for firing, such that, you know, maybe a neuron uh, at this point is, would fire if there's a bar at this orientation, but on the next cycle, it has to be this orientation. Or at a higher level, you might have a neuron that was tuned to or responded to a cat in the world. It might be a cat detector. But if you rewire or change the synaptic weights that are feeding into that neuron, now it's going to respond to different inputs. Neurons don't respond to the world, they respond to their inputs, and now it might become a dog detector or a giraffe sure, detector. Sure, and that, and that makes sense. We, the brain is plastic, things change in the brain, people have a stroke and different areas uh, substitute for it over time, so that, that, that's non-controversial at all. The question is whether you need this definition of information at a higher level to do that. Everything could be accomplished at the cellular level, uh, from what you're saying, the, the, for that one neuron, you could just have a change at the cellular level there. You don't need this higher concept of information to, to make that change. Right. So I'm certainly not saying that, there's, um, that there are informational causal chains that are not physical causal chains. I'm saying there's only physical causal chains. Right. However, some small subset, subset of them are also informational causal chains. How, how can we possibly understand why these are the ones that happen as opposed to all the other ones that are consistent with the laws of physics? Well, I think the only way to understand that is to understand that the neurons are setting informational constraints on, or have informational criteria for what will make them fire. And the that, information itself is nothing more than the the set of parameters uh, or constraints. Uh, uh, but are all, they're all expressed in neuronal activity of some kind. Sure. So there, there's, you know, being a physicalist, I believe there's only <laughs> physical causation. However, um, to only talk about atoms hitting atoms or particles hitting pa particles without talking about information is, I think, uh, misguided. Why? We'll go back to a concept neuron. This concept neuron will fire. It'll do something, alter the system. Uh, physically, if a certain concept is met, you know, Jennifer Anderson is present, you hear her voice, you see her picture, whatever. The only thing <clears throat> that, uh, that unifies all the possible types of input that uh, will make that neuron fire is the fact that there's Jennifer Aniston out there in the world. So this neuron is, in a sense, its firing is multiply realizable. Right. So a key idea, I think, is that, um, you know, if I only now listen to this concept neuron, this Jennifer Aniston neuron. Well, I'll know that Jennifer Aniston is out there in the world somewhere, but listening only to that neuron, I won't know whether I, you know, it was her voice that triggered it or a picture of her that triggered it. Okay, so in right. a way, there's a loss of information about the past. Mm. And so I, you know, if we try to remove the idea of information of Jennifer An Aniston-ness from this equation and talk only about particles hitting particles, I don't think we can give a full account I don't think we can have a true physics of the universe that uh, ignores information because it's, it is the information, in this case, Jennifer Aniston, this, that explains uh, why this neuron fired or not. You know, there's lots of uh, physical um, causal chains that were consistent with the laws of physics, but those that uh, didn't include Jennifer Aniston, this, didn't end up making that neuron fire. So the only way to really understand why this set of uh, causal, physical causal events happen is to bring in the idea that information played a central role. And at that point, once you have the information, in this case, the concept of Jennifer Aniston, and if that's where you start with, it's impossible, even in principle, to go back and, and decide which one of those potentially infinite number of, of pathways right. created that. That's right. So, uh, Therefore, so, that's why information then becomes a, a concept that is a legitimate concept that is irreducible at that point, at least at that point. Right. So if I cannot reconstruct the history of the universe, you know, what led up to this neuron firing, 
that information is essentially lost because this neuron is, its criteria are multiply satisfiable or multiply realizable. Um, then I need to analyze the situation at the level of Jennifer Aniston's or information. You know, it's true for any, any concept. Now, um, if it stopped there, well, it wouldn't be, uh, terribly interesting. Now, the fact that this neuron has fired, uh, must be able to change the informational parameters on other neurons. So that now we can talk about informational causation. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that uh, informational causation is something that is not physical. I'm saying that um, informational causation is a tiny subset of possible physical causation. And the only way to understand why this subset among all the others that were possible occurred is to analyze the situation at the level of informational causation. To analyze it simply at the level of particles hitting particles without bringing in a concept like Jennifer Aniston would miss the main picture.